Welcome to the Everything History Podcast for episode 19, Professor Matheson. I meant to continue with the French Revolution, but I've been quite sick, as you can probably hear. So instead, I present an interview with Professor Matheson that I conducted last week. Professor Matheson is a historian and lecturer that specializes in everything Roman, from Roman history to law to coinage. And now I'll get my voice out of the way. Enjoy. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in the name. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Tell me how you got here as a historian, because as I understand it, you actually had another vocation before you became, uh, before you got into higher education. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, long story, <laughs> used to be, uh, used to be an aerospace engineer, working on designing mm-hmm. the jet engines for the 747 and the F-14. Of course, I had some help. When was this, uh, during the 19... 19- Back in the early 70s. Oh, there we go. Yeah. What made you, uh, want to make the change? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what can I say? I was 26 years old, getting old, <laughs> feeling like an old man, feeling like my life was behind me. And so if I didn't, didn't start to do something that was interesting, start, something to do, you, something you wanted to do. So. so you didn't think, uh, it was interesting to you? Like, uh, aerospace engineering? Like it was, well, why did you go into it in the first place? Oh, well, aeros, <laughs> uh, was, Back in the days of the Vietnam War, right, Uncle, yeah. Uncle Sam wanted to give me a gun. But Uncle Sam said, if you design us some jet fighter planes, then, uh, then you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to pick up a gun. And what made you want to choose studying antiquity, uh, ancient history? It was something that was always interesting. Uh, and I think a lot of people, uh, find history interesting. I, I remember years ago, I don't even know whether they do this anymore, but, Years ago, they would interview all the incoming freshmen mm-hmm. and ask them, if you didn't have to worry about a job, what would you most rather study? And the majority always answered history. Really? And you find people interested in history in all walks of life. Uh, just yesterday, I got a letter from a retired dentist in North Carolina <laughs> who said he just bought my book from Amazon.com and he says he couldn't put it down. And, <laughs> Thanks for writing this book, he says. So, uh, you never know who you're going to touch. Right. And what do you find particularly interesting about like Roman history or ancient Greek history or uh, early medieval history? Well, it's interesting because my undergraduate degree was in astrophysics. Right. And conceptually, there's a lot of similarities between astronomy and ancient history. That is, you can't go to either place, (laughs) but you get information in from them, from whether across the years or across the light years, and it's up to you to analyze that information to try to reconstruct what's actually out there. So uh, Mm. astronomy isn't actually that different from ancient history. So you say your previous study of astronomy, astrophysics, uh, helped you in like analyzing history and whatnot? Well, when it comes to the concepts. Uh, right, like the when it comes concept. to the way, uh, the way that you conceptualize it, it's it's not that different. But I think, like a lot of people, just got interested in it because it was interesting. Right. I mean, it's really, it's really hard to make ancient history boring. Not that I haven't heard some people try some very people try, yeah. <laughs> try very hard to do that, but 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 it it's hard to make ancient history boring because it has so many stories. Uh, they love to tell stories in antiquity, the but the stories story. always had a point. The stories mm-hmm. always had a lesson, and, and so if you've got a difficult lesson that you want to teach, you know, regard to issues of race or gender or ethnicity mm-hmm. or whatever, you put those issues in in a story, and then let people draw their own conclusions. Well, let me transition to Rome with that. What do you think the lesson was of the founding stories of Rome, particularly Romulus and Remus? Why did they tell the stories the way they did? Well, the lessons there, and, and the thing about the Romans we need to understand is that the Romans were fundamentally 
very conservative mm -hmm. and believed the old way was best. And so the older something was, the better that it was. If something was associated with tradition, then that made it good. Uh, unlike the Greeks, the Romans did not value imagination. Right. Uh, and, and, and so you look at the earliest stories of Rome, and the later Roman historians would put all of their most important traditions back in those early stories, trying to explain what the Romans were like, what was important to the Romans. And one of the lessons that comes from the early stories of Rome is the background for the Roman policy of inclusivity. Like, Unlike the Greeks, uh, who thought that anyone who was not Greek was some kind of a subhuman barbarian. Right, they were xenophobic. Very xenophobic, yeah. Uh, the Romans valued their contacts with other peoples, and they uh, they are known for incorporating the traditions of the people that they came into contact with. If you look at the development of the early culture of Rome, mm -hmm. you see that it's, you see almost a laundry list of the customs of the people who lived around them. I mean, they got from the Etruscans ideas ranging from uh, divination, yeah, that is, games. learning the wills of the gods, and the gladiatorial games from the funeral rites, um, not to mention their alphabet, which, <laughs> the, which the Etruscans had gotten from the Greeks. And, mm -hmm. and of course, the Romans are known for picking up, uh, just, just dying, to, uh, dying to gorge themselves on Greek culture. Uh, that's why we call it Greco-Roman culture. Right. Uh, and so... Why do you think they were so inclusive if they were such a conservative culture? Is that like a defense mechanism, or is there a, a deeper meaning to why they're inclusive opposed to xenophobic? Well, when you talk about them being a conservative culture, uh, a conservative culture with a safety valve. Mm -hmm. That is, if, if you are too conservative, you just become too brittle, you, you, you can't respond to change, and you collapse. So the Romans would hold on to their traditions, as long as they could for dear life. Right. But then they were very practical too. Mm -hmm. And if they had to change, then oh, we're very happy to change. <laughs> and 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 so. Um, Can you give an example of that? Uh, the Romans in the Second Punic War, or the First Punic War, mm -hmm. uh, they got involved with the war against the Carthaginians in Sicily. They marched their armies down to the toe of Italy and realized, hey, Sicily's an island. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to get there, we need some boats. Well, the Romans had never had a navy. So they found a Carthaginian warship that had uh, washed up on shore. They re-engineered it. And then they are down on benches on the beach learning how to row. Uh, one example. Right. Uh, the Romans were also very good at being able to re-engineer their own customs, if if you will, in, in order to deal with changing times. Um in the very earliest Roman history, the very er in early Roman society, the Roman family was under the complete and absolute and total domination of the father of the family, right. known as the uh, pater familias, who had life and death authority over the whole Roman family. But uh, this does not mean that fathers were going around killing their families all the time because they were bound by tradition, which said you didn't do that. Right. So uh, the... Uh, in Rome, the use of authority is always tempered by the traditions that say you don't abuse that authority. So, in the Roman family, with the father having absolute and total control over everything, what do you do when you've got a number of sons, and they're getting older, they're getting to their 30s, and they want to have a career of their own, and they're still under dad's legal authority. It's like you're 40 years old, and you have to ask, Dad, can I borrow the car? <laughs> uh, and it gets to the point that if a son wants to get married, wants to buy property, wants to have a political career, you can't, you don't want to be asking Daddy's uh, permission all the time. And in original Roman society, the only way to get out from under Daddy's authority would be for Daddy to die. <laughs> So this could be an incentive to kind of help daddy along the way. Right. And, and so uh, one of the original crimes in Roman society was parasite, killing your father. 
In fact, it was the only crime that there was at the beginning uh, in Rome of the Kings. There was only one crime that would be investigated by the government, and that was killing your father. Speaking of killing your relatives, how important do you think it is that in that Romulus and Remus story, you know, Romulus kills his brother Remus? It mm-hmm. start, okay, it yeah. starts with, you know, murder. How important mm-hmm. do you think that is to, like, Roman culture? Because they could have just, you know, at some point cut that out. Well, uh, they not only, they not only, he not only killed his brother, but they also killed their uncle too. Right. Uh, which, he, he might have had that one coming. <laughs> which, which was why they had to go found a new city because they right. couldn't stay in the old city because they had blood guilt. Right. And speaking of Roman conservatism and the Pod Familias and the family, what is the ideal Roman to the Romans? Oh, the ideal Roman is someone who would look to us to be very boring. Because they valued virtues like like doing your duty mm-hmm. and uh, responsibility. In fact, all of Roman society was built upon people doing mutual duties for each other. Um, and so... Clientella? Every, yeah, the system of clientella, where uh, you would get two people, they would enter into this relationship, and they would each owe each other mutual duties. And it would never occur to anybody not to do their duty because that was what Romans did. They did their duty. And this is reflected in the Roman concept of giving favors, of doing people favors. If you did a favor for a Roman, then the Roman owed you a favor in return. I mean, you could be the lowest ranking plebeian and do a favor for the highest ranking patrician, and that patrician would owe you a favor. That is, you would become the you would become the patron of that patrician. So, what is a patrician going to want to do just as quickly as he can? Get rid of that contract. Going to want to pay you back. Yeah. Whereas in the case of the ancient Greeks, if you did an ancient Greek a favor, the response of the Greek would be, "Ha ha! Now I'm one up on you." Right. Um, and and so so be, because of this glue, this um, glue of mutual duties and responsibility that holds Roman society together, you didn't have the kind of uh, violent social unrest that you often had in ancient Greece. And did this change, this concept of the ideal conservative Roman doing his duty, did that change from the Republic to early empire to late empire at all? Never. Never? Never. Uh, that, that, that was always the ideal. And in fact, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the places that you see this, the exercise of Roman conservatism, is with uh, the Roman concept of law, that mm-hmm. is, of the the rule of law. Everybody is under the law, and that includes um, not only the people, but also the officials. And this concept is transmitted into the Roman Empire, where the Hollywood view of Roman emperors is you have the, these autocratic, despotic emperors who are ignoring the laws and just behaving completely tyrannically. No. I mean, even the most despotic Roman emperor, or the person who's looked upon as being the more uh, weird of the Roman emperors, like Caligula or Domitian or Commodus, they all acknowledged the rule of law. And anything they were going to do, they were going to do legally. And this tradition continued right on into the, uh, the later Roman Empire, which, another name for the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so the, 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 this... Uh, a fundamental underpinning, foundation of conservatism, respect, uh, respect for tradition, respect for the rule of law, is one of the things that made the Roman state, uh, the Roman government, which uh, the Roman Republic lasted mm-hmm. from 509 BC until the fall of Constantinople in 1453 CE. Rome or the Republic? Uh, uh, Rome was always the Republic. Oh, really? It was always called the Republic. Always seen itself as the Republic. Yeah. So it lasted for nearly 2,000 years, which is easily the longest lasting, continually functioning government that the world has ever seen. Right. And a lot of 19th century, 18th century historians, they tend to describe Rome as falling around 476, especially as the date they like to use. Do you think Rome ever really fell, or did it just morph, disintegrate, and then like rebuild in different fashions? Well, that's another one of the 
you know, another one of the popular urban legends that has arisen around the fall of the Roman Empire, which has to do with if you're an historian, you want to have a nice, neat end to the story. Right. Want to have a set date. So, so the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 or 480 or whatever you want to date it, that's just the fall of the Western Roman Empire. But it's an empire that took an awfully long time to fall. I mean, the first barbarian invasion, if you will, of the Roman Empire was almost exactly a hundred years earlier. And, and, and so we have to disabuse ourselves of this idea of these uncivilized savage barbarians with horns on their helmets, right, yeah. pounding on the gates of Rome and destroying civilization and creating the Dark Ages. Speaking of barbarians, how would the Romans define a barbarian, or how would you define it, the term barbarian? Well, like a lot of loaded words, it has it can be defined in different ways in different kinds of circumstances. For example, in the literary tradition, the term barbarian had a long-standing existence as a person who couldn't speak the language of intellectual discourse, would be it Greek or Latin. Mm -hmm. And, 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 um, a person who was very different from us. So there was this binary distinction between, uh, barbarian and Roman or Greek or whatever, or just between civilized and barbarian, which has a long literary tradition. But on the ground in the real world of the Roman Empire, a barbarian was just a person who came from the other side of the frontier. Right. Uh, and could be, it, it ha had, little to say about somebody's cultural affiliations because if you're talking culture and if you're talking about being barbarian in a cultural sense then there were barbarians who came from inside the Roman Empire too from mm -hmm. the backwoods of Anatolia uh, the backwoods of North Africa uh, even from someplace like Sardinia <laughs> I mean they were also barbarians in that sense. So when, when talking about barbarians and barbarian invasion, we need to be very careful about what kind of barbarian are we talking about. Right. The relationship between the Roman state and barbarian groups, as we just talked about, became really unique and, as you said, hard to describe as Rome transitioned into the late empire. And many historians describe the Western Empire as falling after wave after wave of barbarian mm -hmm. invasions, right? Uh, from groups like the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, Franks, and a few more, you have proposed something a little bit different. Like, what do you call this wave of barbarian invasions, this barbarization? Well, uh, even the most, the strongest proponent of barbarian invasions, Peter Heather, mm -hmm. can really, in the course of the 100 years between the, uh, between the Battle of Adrianople, the big defeat by the Romans in 378, between that battle and the fall of the Roman Empire a hundred years later, he can only identify one actual barbarian invasion, uh, which was the crossing of the Rhine in the, in the, at the end of the year 406. So there clearly has to be something else going on because, be, because these ways of barbarian invasions with all the arrows that you see in yeah. the older textbooks just, just didn't happen. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that ought to give us pause is that if we're talking about a military conquest of the Western Roman Empire, when there were battles, and there weren't very many, there were very few battles, why did the Romans win almost all of them? So there must have been something else going on. And that something else that was going on was that these so-called barbarians are just people from the other side of the frontier right who have been uh, recruited into the Roman army, which the Romans have been doing ever since the time of Augustus, the very first Roman emperor. There was nothing new about recruiting Romans into the Roman army. One of the reasons they were recruiting more barbarians into the Roman army was because, especially in the Western Roman Empire, the economy was in a shambles. Right. In, in the year 442, the rest, Western emperor had to declare bankruptcy. It's, it's a lot cheaper to hire barbarian mercenaries on an as-needed basis than it is to maintain a full-scale standing army, which the you have Romans, to pay yes. whether you're using it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so you uh, you had these kind of wandering armies that were led 
both by people we would call barbarians and by people we would call Romans, uh, wandering around the landscape. So this idea that they're like these, you know, otherworldly, you know, bearded, like naked, walking around, so would you call them really just Romanized people that are, right, just from the other frontier or something oh, like that? Yeah, uh, they become Romans. Right. Uh, they, 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 they be, and, and there was a long tradition of the Romans, uh, uh, of the Romans just transferring <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of barbarians into the Roman Empire because the Roman government, the Romans always needed uh, new farmers mm -hmm. and they needed new soldiers. And people from the other side of the frontier were very good at both. <laughs> Uh, and, and then they just... And did these uh, barbarians want to come into the empire? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Why absolutely. did they want to come in? The Roman Empire was the promised land. Right. I mean, just look around the world in the modern day. You see, uh, why do hundreds of thousands of refugees want to move from one place to another place? Be, be, because they think uh, they can have a better life. Right. And, and the, the barbarians outside the Roman Empire... Again, if we disabuse ourselves this notion of these savage barbarian hordes who appear out of nowhere and catch the Romans by surprise, these barbarian peoples had been living on the frontiers of the Roman Empire for hundreds of years. Uh, they had been serving in the Roman army, going back home, uh, moving back and forth. Uh, if you lived up in the frontier zone and you had a really good drunk one night and didn't know you you could wake up on either side of the frontier you wouldn't know what side of the frontier you were really on matter. uh uh because there would be the same kind of people same kind of language same kind of dress same kind of culture so after roughly 476 480 whether or not we're going off of Romulus Augustus or Julius Nepos or something like that how did these how did the government change if at all in the western uh, roman world uh the government of the barbarian kingdoms uh, the barbarian kings modeled themselves on Roman emperors. I mean, they did everything that Roman emperors would do. Mm -hmm. uh, they issued laws. They issued coins. Uh, they built buildings. They built public works. Um, they had the same kind of administrations with the same kind of officials who did the same kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But they were smaller. Uh, they didn't have, the barbarian kings didn't have the same resources that the Roman Empire had had. So it's on a, on a much, um, lower level. So what are the distinctions, uh, between these barbarian Romans, as whatever we want to call these people, these Romanized others? <laughs> what are the distinctions between them and the Romans that say live there and function there, you know, for the past 400 years in that empire? It's very hard to find any. Um, it's like any kind of a situation where, and again, we can use a modern analogy, mm -hmm. where you, you have a, a, a number of immigrants from somewhere else, uh, moving into an established population base. Um, there will be some cultural differences and some, uh, needs for reorientation or assimilation. But I think we need to emphasize that when we're talking about assimilation, both in antiquity and in the modern day, assimilation isn't just a one-way street. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you talk about immigrants moving into the Roman Empire, it's not just them assuming Roman culture, it's Romans assuming their culture, right. just like, uh, just like in the modern day. Uh, you know, my people still have their lutefisk mm -hmm. and, 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 and various aspects of the culture from the old country. Uh, and, and uh, it was very much the same after the fall of the Roman Empire, with the realizing that the numbers of barbarians, so-called, were just a drop in a Roman sea. So we're, we're talking very small. We're talking uh, millions of Romans, maybe tens of thousands of, of, of barbarians. So it, it was necessary for barbarian kings and, and for individual barbarians to assimilate, uh, and to essentially become Roman. But, uh, that kind of an affiliation was a political affiliation. If you were living in the Visigothic kingdom, mm -hmm. didn't matter, didn't matter whether you were a Roman or, or a Goth or a Frank. I mean, you were a Visigoth. 
Right, and speaking of that, let's just like kind of flesh this out. After, during that time period, late 5th century we're talking about, where did these um, tribes, I guess we'll call them, like the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Vandals, Franks, I think we can guess where the Franks mm-hmm. ended up, but where did all these people end up? Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, there are no tribes. Uh, we, uh, we have Native American tribes. We don't have barbarian tribes. We can, uh, uh, the word used by the Romans was gentes, which would be uh, peoples or nations. Now you do. Uh, now the Romans did use the uh, did use the word tribes. In fact, it's, it's the origin of the word tribes. Going back to what we were first talking about, the first foundation of Rome, tribes. and how inclusive the Romans were. Uh, the Romans believed the original Roman people were made up of uh, thirds: the original Romans and the Sabines and the Etruscans. Mm-hmm. And is and like you said, it's the word tribus, tribes, and that's where tribes come from. But. Uh, uh, there were no barbarian tribes. So uh, where do these barbarian nations, uh, where do they all end up? At least for a period of time, I guess. Well, you mean, I, I think it would be better to say where do they all develop sure. as opposing to, to ending up, because that... Uh, Word choice is very hard. Right? <laughs> that kind of tends to uh, reify this old idea of, you know, of the Vandals beginning in Jutland, uh, in Utland, 300 years ago. And then somehow <laughs> traveling around and maintaining their identity and somehow not having any contact with any other peoples for about 300 years. And then all of a sudden they settle in Africa. <laughs> so uh, you say that question really isn't even valid, trying to like find out where these people uh, really settled? Because they didn't, never really did it. They yeah. just developed in a weird kind of functional oh, way. Uh, yeah, they did. I mean, people calling themselves Vandals or Visigoths or Franks, or Alemanni, or Lombards, or Burgundians did did establish kingdoms on the territory of the old Roman Empire. But 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 it's 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 very hard to draw a direct connection between these kingdoms that eventually evolved on Roman territory and any peoples who were wandering around at some time before that. Because, as we discussed uh, before, these kingdoms that were developed were very largely Roman mm-hmm. and very largely Romanized and made use of uh, Roman customs and Roman laws. And, 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 and a lot of the leaders of these kingdoms initially uh, were individuals who had been high-ranking Roman generals. Yeah. All right, I'll let you knock this episode out with a story about the conflict over the quote-unquote last Roman emperor. Uh, the end of the Roman Empire, that, uh, that's a very interesting, probably an idea that has just a continued popular appeal. I mean, if, if, if somebody doesn't know anything about the Roman Empire, they, knew the Ro- they, know, the Ro- they know the Roman Empire fell. Right. Might, might not know why. And they might have an idea that somehow the connection, there's a connection between the fall of the Roman Empire and the fall of the American Empire. Because one thing you learn when you study empires, looking back through history, they fall. Every empire that has ever fall, has ever risen, has fallen. Mm-hmm. And so what does that say about the future of the American Empire? <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, there's always been some discussion about who was the last Roman emperor. And is generally look in most of the history books, and you will see the last Roman emperor was a boy named Romulus. He was nicknamed the Little Augustus, Romulus Augustulus, mm-hmm. the Little Augustus, and um, he was deposed in the year 476 mm-hmm. by a barbarian army general named Odovacar. The only complication to that story is that there already was a Roman emperor in the West, Julius Nepos. Right who um, had been sent off into exile by little Romulus's father, who had been the secretary of Attila the Hun. <laughs> and so little Romulus actually was a usurper. So when little Romulus gets deposed in the year 476, he, the legal Roman emperor is still Julius Nepos, who's off in exile in Greece, and he doesn't die until the year 480. So why, you might wonder, have historians been so eager to name little Romulus Augustus as the last Roman emperor? 
as opposed to Julius Nepos. It seems to fit with the name. They like you it. can't. I mean, how can you resist? <laughs> it's just. It's. It's just so perfect. Rome was founded by Romulus. Mm -hmm. The last Roman emperor is named Romulus. The Roman emperor was founded by Augustus. The last Roman emperor is named Augustus. I mean, you just can't pass it up. All right, uh, we'll leave it there. All right, thank you for being on. So, good luck. Another thank you to Professor Matheson for joining me, and with any luck, I shall continue the French Revolution next week. And remember, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or I dare say corrections, send them my way at everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and talk to you again next week. Thank you very much.